afternoon. Welcome to Spy Chat. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our Executive Director, Chris Costa, is joined by Ambassador Roger D. Carstens, who serves as the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. The ambassador is the former deputy assistant secretary in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor at the US Department of State, where he oversaw the bureau's work in Near Eastern Affairs, Western Hemisphere Affairs and the Office of Security and Human Rights. Previously, he served in Amman, Jordan as the country director for UA US based INGO that provided humanitarian assistance and stability support to Syrian refugees and internally displaced persons. Prior positions include senior civilian advisor on the commander's advisory and assistance team in Afghanistan, senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security and special assistant for legislative affairs in the office of the Secretary of Defense. The ambassador is a retired army lieutenant colonel who served in special forces and the first ranger battalion. After Chris and the ambassador discuss the issues that are catching their attention, we'll turn to your questions. And if you've been with us before, you know, please use the Q&A feature to write them in. We will do our best to get to as many of them as possible, but I anticipate a lot of questions. So, so forgive us if we don't now. Without further ado, over to you, Chris Costa. Amanda, as always, thank you very much for the nice setup. I, I often say that it's a privilege to do a spy chat with whoever our guests are, and it is a privilege, but this particular spy chat is very important to us. It was audience demanded. We always talk about a hostage case that's in the news and getting Ambassador Carstens to step away just for an hour from his tireless important work is absolutely crucial. And uh, moreover, he spent the last three or four days with me, so he's probably tired of spending more time with me. Uh, we got in late last night or last evening from Qatar, and I'll talk about that momentarily. But I also told the ambassador that um, I wasn't seeking his permission to just mention something I think is really important and really underscores who Ambassador Carstens is, not only who he is, but what he does. And that is back in March, he received 2023's Robert A. Levinson Excellence in Government Service Award from the Foley Foundation. That is a prestigious award, and it was given as a result of his tireless, extensive work at bringing justice, uh, bringing hostages home to their families, and his thoughtful engagements with families. And of course, that work never ends, and we have talked about that quite often. If you bring home one hostage, one wrongfully detained individual, there are others that are still out there. So you have to celebrate only momentarily, only quietly with your team. And that's another point I want to make. Um, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Karsten's team because they made this happen. And there's a lot of competing requirements. And also, I want to remind our audience, they're always respectful of this, but you're working active cases. So we appreciate, Ambassador, that there are some things that you cannot say. So we really defer to your judgment for that. Um, without further ado, what I want to do also, I promised I'd mention, I'm sorry, uh, the bilater bilateral cutter hostage recovery exercise that we participated in. Our team is going to post a couple uh, links to some of the reporting by the government of Qatar and some of the uh, news outlets in Doha, which I think underscore the great partnership between the Qatari uh, government and various agencies within Qatar and all of our uh, exercise that we executed a few days ago. I, it was extraordinary to spend that amount of time with you and also to see the U.S. hostage enterprise partnered with our foreign counterparts. And really, it was the first time exercise to look at 
building a joint capacity to resolve hostage problems. So that was extraordinary. Maybe we'll have some follow up questions from that. So without further ado, let me just jump into a few things that I'm thinking about to frame uh, the discussion. Uh, first and foremost, there was an article in Wall Street Journal that underscored why um, perhaps uh, Ambassador Carstens received the Levinson Award. The families are particularly appreciative of Roger's commitment, Ambassador Carstens' commitment to bringing home hostages, because he not only has to engage on the cases worldwide, globally, tirelessly, but at the same time, he has to engage with families, families because families demand the U.S. government to continue to tirelessly work on those respective cases. The Wall Street Journal's piece that was published that really profiled Ambassador Carstens talked about the primary task of winning the release of detained Americans, be they detained by uh, countries like Russia, countries like China, countries like Myanmar, or be they held by terrorists. Ambassador Carstens in his office and others within the U.S. hostage enterprise are responsible for bringing those ca cases to a successful outcome. So I very much appreciated the Wall Street Journal uh, article that was written that also talked, of course, about Evan uh, Gerskovich and the idea that he is a wrongful detainee, which means that falls in the lap of Ambassador Carstens to continue to work that case as he worked on Miss Griner's case, as he is no doubt working on the case of Paul Whelan. And we should note that there's always going to be um, some consternation if one person is brought home and another is not. For example, Paul Whelan, or in the case of uh, of uh, prisoner swaps, in quotes. So let me also kind of go around the world and take you to Africa because um, Ambassador Carstens has had success in something like two dozen cases, him and his team in the enterprise. And some of those cases the public has heard about, others you have not heard about. But that is significant um, given that I spent a year in the Trump White House and we could count successes on one hand. Um, that said, we are all committed to, to working these cases. But one of the cases that happened while I was at the at the White House was with Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Woodkey, who was uh, taken hostage in Niger, likely moved to Mali. I wasn't privy to the debriefs, but that happened uh, while I was in the White House in 2017. He spent six years in captivity. And recently, I think in March, he was returned to the United States uh, to be rejoined with his spouse. Uh, so that's a success that we talked about on Spy Chat. Of course, um, there's another case we also reference, which is a very different dynamic, but it represents the spectrum of cases. It was a dissident that was very outspoken and very critical of the Rwandan government, but the Rwandan government uh, made a decision working with the United States government, ultimately, and other actors to release Paul Rosas Bajina. Um, that's a tough name to remember. Uh, Paul was uh, famously um, the real individual that uh, was played by in a movie on Rwanda's genocide in 1994. It was a Oscar nominated movie, Hotel Rwanda. Paul was re recently reunited with his family. Again, that's a political case, if you will. He was wrongfully detained. I believe that was the status held uh, by the U.S. government. Um, China, another story that really got my attention, something we collectively need to watch, of course, um, us from the outside and within the U.S. government, uh, we have to pay close attention to China's laws because their internal laws make routine business potentially ambiguously look more like espionage activities. So what does that mean practically? That means that a businessman that thinks he is doing bona fide business in China might be vulnerable to espionage charges. So the United States government, the FBI in particular, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center is providing warnings to US businesses to ensure they are aware of these changing dynamics. Uh, the next case that really got my attention or 
really, it's linked to sanctions. Last year, President Biden uh, reinforced the idea that the United States is going to use sanctions, and they have uh, recently, the United States used sanctions on specific actors in the case of Russia that are directly responsible for uh, potentially putting pressure on Americans in Russia, meaning FSB intelligence officers are individually sanctioned by name, several in Russia, but also importantly, Iranians that were involved with Bob Levinson, the former FBI agent that was held and died in activity, or I'm sorry, in captivity in Iran. Um, of course, the Levinson Award was named in in uh, memorial to to Bob. Uh, at the same time, we've identified the United States has identified individuals that needed to be sanctioned in Iran. I think that is really an important escalation. I'm going to switch gears for a second and talk about a terrorism case in Israel. So not a U.S. case, but an individual that was studying at Princeton, Princeton University for uh, graduate work, went to Iraq. She is a uh, dual citizen of Russia, interestingly, and Israel. She is being held uh, by a, a uh, militia that's Iranian-backed. And of course, Israel is working likely night and day with Iraq, the government of Iraq, to try to free this individual that's being held by a malign militia movement that is backed notably by the country of Iran. So that is a broad swath of the cases and the articles that got my attention in the last couple of months. It's a bit of a review for some of the people tuning in to Spy Chat today. We've talked about them, but it's a great, I think, a great starting place. I'll turn to Roger in, in just a moment. Of course, there's the possibility of prisoner swaps. There's been some reporting on that. I, I think it's inappropriate to go too deep on that, but there's a possibility that Russia is interested in some kind of swap uh, swap that takes place, which looks a lot like uh, Cold War prisoner swaps that took place that we've talked about, Bridge of Spies, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a possibility down the line. In the last case I want to mention, and it's near and dear to me and, and also to Ambassador Carstens and many people in the hostage enterprise, and it's the, um, the case of Austin Tice, who is being held by the government of Syria. Last year, the president demanded uh, Syria to release Austin Tice, and Syria still continues to deny holding him. And that is a significant problem. And I know that's a tough case to talk about, um, but likely many actors are involved behind the scenes trying to uh, free Austin. And the last the last, last item, because that's a lot of ground to cover, a book recommendation by Jerry Van Dyke, uh, Ambassador, you and I didn't talk about this, but I like to recommend a book, and it's Jerry Van Dyke's book entitled Without Borders, His Time with the Haqqanis. It's a fascinating book. Full disclosure, uh, Jerry is a part of the Foley Foundation, but I heard an NPR interview. I know Jerry Van Dyke, and his story is fascinating. He was held by the, the lethal Haqqani network, and he has a fascinating story. So that's a lot. I really like to turn it over to you. Maybe you can share uh, with our audience a little bit about how it is you do the work that you do, Ambassador. Over to you. Chris, what a generous introduction. I thank you so much. Uh, and I'm sure your audience knows a little bit about you. The, the first thing they should know about you is that your office looks much cleaner and nicer than mine. Uh, you'll look at uh, yours. You have a your bronze stars. I, know, I recall you've won uh, two bronze stars, been awarded two bronze stars for your work in Afghanistan. Uh, you have a beautiful bookshelf, some pretty good, uh, I think it looks like a bunch of spies meeting in that beautiful uh, painting behind your back. And in mine, working the government, I'm uh, being highlighted by, by a fluorescent light. And you can see the Home Depot five gallon bucket above my uh, my. Uh, wall locker there. But it's great to be with such a hero. Uh, you've always been a hero of mine, more so since I've got to, I've had a better chance to get to know you. Um, enjoyed every minute that I've had a chance to spend with you and your wonderful wife, Donna, whether it's been here in the United States or overseas in Doha, where you did a wonderful job of providing your leadership and expertise to an incredible exercise. Uh, and, and Chris, anytime I can talk with 
an Army colonel who served as the civilian director for Naval Special Warfare, who's in the Commando Hall of Fame, signed me up. This was a no-brainer coming to chat with you about this. But I'm grateful that you were able to, um, or kind enough to invite us to talk to you today. Uh, I know your audience is probably pretty switched on and knows a lot about these things because you've been talking about it for a while. And yet it seems to, this topic seems to have uh, truly jumped onto the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and even locals around the United States, in part because I think you can say that anecdotally, um, uh, this seems to be a problem on the rise. Uh, while hostage taking might be fall, falling a little bit, those of wrongful detention are on the rise. Uh, and if I may for your readers, and I'm pretty sure they already know this, but let's define a hostage as someone taken by a terrorist group, and we'll define a wrongful detention as someone who is taken and held by a nation state and most likely being used for political leverage. But regardless, um, this has become a, a much bigger topic. The, re the uh, President of the United States has uh, given us more resources in order to pursue this mission. But what I'm grateful to tell you all is that whether it is in a, in a Republican administration or under a Democrat administration, uh, this is seen as a nonpartisan uh, effort. It's an American problem, not a Republican problem, not a Democrat problem. I can also tell you that we um, have a lot of bipartisan uh, support on the Hill. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, had a chance to I should say the honor to brief members of Congress. And at the end of some very interesting and sometimes tough briefings, I walk away knowing that I have the full support of the members on Capitol Hill. But maybe what I wouldn't mind also saying uh, to kind of, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this will guide the discussion, but I wouldn't mind throwing this out there, is you were kind enough to highlight that uh, I received a recognition this year. And when you do, you always feel in SPIHA, my organization, SPIHA, the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, you always seem to feel kind of a little bit of stolen valor because it's never just Spiha who brings someone home. Uh, in fact, if anything, uh, and Tim, you did highlight it's a team effort. Uh, there's, there are a lot of people that bring every American home, whether it's, as you mentioned, Paul Rusesa Bagina, whether it's Jeffrey Woodkey, whether it's the nine people that we brought out of Venezuela last year. Uh, there are usually hundreds of people that are involved. And those people come not only from my office, but the regional office within the Department of State, um, I would say the broader interagency, whether it be CIA, Department of Justice, Department of Treasury, the White House, uh, members on Capitol Hill and their staffs, uh, NGOs like the Foley Foundation, like Hostage US, uh, and even members of the business world, and certainly members uh, that uh, are allied with the United States. I'd say partners like Qatar, for example, that broad group of people, organization, networks, and countries participate in every single return. So while SPIHA at times might be in the spotlight for uh, what people might say is quarterbacking the release, the truth is more that uh, it's that old JSOC phrase, it takes a network to defeat a network. We have painstakingly, and maybe sometimes through dumb luck, been able to grow and expand a network of people who care about this topic and are willing to participate in the bringing of Americans home. So maybe I'd, I'd turn the camera back on, on, on you and say, Chris, I'm excited to talk to you today in your audience because you're now a part of that network. Chris, you always have been. You, If anything, uh, the work that you did at the White House during your time here, that's kind of what we built this network upon. As they say, you stand on the shoulders of giants and I'm certainly, certainly standing on yours, but your audience through your, um, I guess, sharing of awareness of this problem and having been kind enough to host us today is also now a part of that broad network. And when the president has to make a hard decision to bring someone home, I know it can count on the support of a lot of people out there and many people that I will never have the honor or pleasure of meeting. Chris, I could talk forever. You know that you've been with me, but let me pause, catch my breath a bit and let you react or see if you want to take the conversation in one direction or the other. You know, I don't have anything uh, to add. Your remarks were right, right on target, as I expected. I appreciate your comments, and I would underscore this notion of a network and the idea that we are all connected um, in government and outside the government. And it, it's an extraordinary 
atmospheric for Washington, D.C., and it's highly unusual that we are able to work as not only uh, collaborating together on these problems, but suffice to say, I think we are all friends collectively, people that are committed to this, whether it's folks at the Foley Foundation, as you said, and Hostage U.S. So I know there are a lot of questions. So I think we can play off of our audience questions. Uh, they usually come up with some uh, pretty impressive insights. So I'm going to turn it over to Amanda and let her drive the rest of the program through some of the curated questions. Over to you, Amanda. They have been flying in and they are very excellent. So as, as we know, our audience is so clever. Very wonderful opening comments. Um, this one came in early, uh, very intriguing. When a country is taken over by a coup, as in Niger or some other country with uh, similar political instability, and the U.S. government does not recognize this, the new government, how does that affect any possible hostage negotiations? Wow, that is a good question. I, I, yeah. I, you warned me that your audience was pretty sharp. I, I guess I shouldn't be too shocked to get such a great uh, uh, question thrown at me. You know, um, we've worked through all sorts of problems like that. Uh, I mean, there was a time, of course, when, uh, not even a time, I mean, Mali, of course, underwent a coup, and yet we still had to work through the Jeffrey uh, Woodkey um, effort. Uh, we had Sue Ann Tennyson, uh, a nun who was held hostage uh, down in that area as well. And even though the U.S. government um, had uh, a, a pretty tough relationship with the government of Mali, um, as widely as it was widely reported, uh, Chris O'Leary, the head of the hostage recovery fusion cell, Chris O'Leary and I went down to Mali to talk to President Goita uh, to get a sense of how we could collaborate and work together on bringing Jeffrey Woodkey and Sue Ellen Tennyson home. So even though there might be some hurdles. Now, I would say that maybe I'll give you some examples. There, there's always a way to work through these things. Uh, we have a lot of tension right now with Russia, and yet we've still been able to bring two people home uh, in just about the last year. Uh, we have a lot of tension with Venezuela, but we've been able to work with the Venezuelans to return nine people. Um, there are obviously tensions uh, uh, between us and, and the government of Afghanistan right now, and yet we still are able to work through that to try to uh, bring resolution. And Mali might be the most germane example of where a government's gone through a coup. A coup. The United States, uh, due to certain laws, is unable to provide uh, a certain level of support to a government that's just had a coup. Uh, it's, it's harder to have a, a formal and informal relationship with a government that's just undergone a coup. And yet, uh, Jeffrey Woodkey and Sister Sue Ellen are now back in their homes. So that's a long way of saying that whether we're almost at a state of war with the country, or whether we are enjoying good diplomatic relations, my, my organization with the support of the White House keeps pushing forward. And maybe the best way to look at it is, uh, I'm, I'm mindful, I'm an old man, I'm not long, young like most of the people on the screen. I remember uh, well the Vietnam War when there were still forces in the field shooting at each other, and yet the United States was in, in Paris talking to the North Vietnamese about how to return our prisoners of war. So there's something odd about this space whether you call them hostages, wrongful detainees, or prisoners of war, people are still able to get together and find ways to resolve this. Maybe yet another example, uh, Russia is at war with the Ukraine, and yet they've had numerous hostage exchanges or prisoner of war exchanges. So if a country is overthrown, uh, don't expect that to slow us down a little bit. There'll be a few obstacles, and maybe to use a, a very uh, a novel term of art in the military, there might be some cheetah flips to uh, conduct but we're willing to do whatever we need to do to get to the table, you, talk to other people. You got to, you got to tell, you got to tell, uh-uh. <laughs> Cheetah flips it. That would be uh, whatever you got to do to just get to the, get to the problem and solve it. Uh, so yeah, I'd say we're very experienced with cheetah flips in, a, in our office. In fact, um, you know, Chris has been over here. Uh, if you were to come to the state department, it's usually a place where people are, um, I don't know, State Department-ish, right? You think of the State Department as a very impressive aircraft carrier moving, you know, through the waters with great power and strength. My office is more like a hospital emergency room where we are trying to do anything we can to get the negotiation up and running while talking to the families, while working with the interagency. So 
you know, there's a level of energy in this office that uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fun to experience. But really, the bottom line is, that to, and to really just sum it up, a coup or not, we're going to sit down with whoever is holding our Americans and trying to find a way to bring them home. Yeah, and that was well said. I would just add that an overarching objective of the presidential policy directive is to ensure that the U.S. government is engaged, as Ambassador Carson's just said, that they're talking to terrorists. There's a misconception oh, that you, we don't talk to terrorists. Of course we talk to terrorists. That's the only way, if we can get access to a third party or direct access, that's the only way we're going to move the football forward, so to speak, by engaging at every level we can. Coup, terrorists, uh, Ambassador Carstens made the point. His office and this enterprise is committed to bringing Americans home and the foreign actors that are co-located with Americans. I, I want to make the point that the United States is going to work uh, on on other cases as well. Um, when a, when a foreigner is is captured and held by a terrorist group, and we have purview over that because of our positioning in the world. So great question. All right, here is one. I was going to ask this for myself because Chris knows I do that, but it's better when it comes in from the audience. And so the second question that rolled in: What category does someone like Private Travis King, who? wandered in, defected to North Korea? What was he doing? What category does he fall into? What do we do with him or for him or do we? Great question. I'm, I'm sure there are people uh, at the State Department who are like, don't answer that, take an easy out, but I'm gonna jump into it. Um, you know, so if, let's say, let's say it wasn't North Korea. Let's say that something strange happened. It was with South Korea, but it was US military member. Uh, in that case, uh, the State Department has to uh, defer to the Department of Defense because there's a status of forces agreement that guides the relationships between military members of the United States, saying in South, South Korea, or alternatively, if South Korean members were uh, attending a, a military school in the United States, for example. When it's North Korea, no such animal exists. There is no status of forces agreement. Uh, he belongs to the military. So uh, I think at first blanche and on first pass, we're going to defer to the military. Um, Having said that, as facts become available, uh, it could one day become wrongful. You know, there could be uh, there could be parts of this that, if you were to take a look at the facts and apply the Elevenson Act over the top of them, we might start coming to the conclusion that it might require a diplomatic engagement, not a military or mill-to-mill uh, -mill engagement, to affect his release. Now, that doesn't always necessarily have to be done by my office, uh, especially if he's not declared wrongfully detained. But say consular affairs still has an interest. But I, I think I can tell you, you know, you've probably seen from all the reporting that even though he ran across the border, we still have an interest in making sure he's okay. We would love to get him back. We need to find out more information. As I understand, the UN command is engaged with the North Koreans to figure out if there's a way to resolve this. But uh, maybe the long and short of it is uh, we're going to want to make sure he's okay, bring him back, and there is an outside chance it would fall into my lap and it's one of our cases if he's determined to be wrongfully detained, but we're not quite there yet. You know, uh, there's some cases that seem to happen very fast. Evan Gershkovich is a good example. A credentialed reporter, credentialed by the Russians, who's arrested by the Russians, and the facts are pretty much being reported on CNN. That took us about, uh, I think, 10 or 11 days to go from his arrest to receiving a declaration of wrongfulness. There are other cases that go on for many months, some that might be a year or two, until all the facts seem to come in. And what we do in my office is we're constantly vacuuming the world to try to get as much information as we can. And I can tell you of a case or two where it's not wrongful and suddenly we'll get a report from, say, the Central Intelligence Agency or from a family member or from a journalist or from someone, maybe a third party intermediary like a lawyer. And it's just that last bit of information that allows us to say, this now seems wrongful, let's get it to the Secretary of Defense for a decision. So I hope that scratched the itch, but on this case, believe me, we're following it, not mine yet, may go there one day eventually, but we have to let the facts present themselves, and then we're gonna apply the Levinson Act on top of that. Anything additional, Chris, or? Uh, no, I would just make the point that, and also the other 
I won't say tension, but the other dynamic is the fact that lots and lots of people are reaching out to, I suspect, to uh, the ambassador's office to, to advocate for their loved one make him a wrongful detainee so you can work this case differently and with a different focus in accordance with the Levinson Act that lays out a criteria, a relatively new act signed by President Trump, acknowledged and fully supported by President Biden. So again, it's an interesting dynamic and I didn't have all of those tools just a few years ago. So we see the evolution of this problem, the goodness of a, a of a, a network, but at the same time, the threat landscape is hostage taking landscape, I should say, is changing dramatically for the worse uh, in my my estimation. Over to you, Amanda. All right. Well, the call is coming from inside the house. This is from one of our colleagues who wants to know, our VP of exhibitions wants to know, can you explore the complexities of negotiating with terrorists? It has seemed so controversial over the years and we hear about it in all the movies. We don't negotiate with terrorists. So what's the reality? So it's, it's but I guess in a way we have a line. We've said uh, that President Reagan famously said that the United States does not negotiate with terrorists. You pause dramatically and then say, but we do. And so SPIHA is allowed by executive order and presidential uh, uh, policy directive to have those conversations. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think, uh, you know, as Chris uh, has probably told the audience and is his, his pathway to, to uh, bring us together today, um, there was a time when the United States uh, didn't handle these cases that well, and Syria is kind of like the, the picture-perfect example of, of how bad we were at it. Uh, if a family called up and said, my son's been taken hostage in Syria, roughly 2014, there really wasn't, uh, a, rep there wasn't a point of contact for whom that person should talk to. Whether it was in the Department of Defense or the State Department, what you'd find is a family member being passed all around State, Defense, the White House, and being told, not sure I'm the right person, or I can't tell you the information's classified. And so it became very problematic. And so the question that was just asked, really, if you were to turn that around, that's the reason that this office exists. It was uh, created along with the hostage recovery fusion cell and the hostage response group at the White House in order to answer that. Who is going to talk to the terrorist? Who's in charge of the information? Who convenes the interagency? How do we render those decisions? And we're now into a place where, uh, and, and not only do we have the structure, but we have the inroads. When I first took this job, I, to be honest, I wasn't entirely sure who I should call at the CIA or who was my interface at the Department of Justice. Now we talk all day long. How, how many times do I talk to the White House a day? It's almost impossible to count. It's not five, six, or seven. It's all day long we're talking to the White House. If I have to talk to DOJ, I know exactly who to chat with. If I have to talk to the agency, I know who to call there. So we build these inroads. And so if a, if a hostage organization were to take Amer an American, we now have a process, we now have relationships, we now have a way of doing business that allows us to push forward with a strategy. We're able to come up maybe ahead of time with, with almost our laundry list of things that we might be able to offer in order to break someone uh, through. The complexities of a hostage case though, uh, I'll throw a few out. Number one, there's always a military and law enforcement line of effort. So you would love to talk uh, a group out of your Jeffrey Woodkeys, you know, Jane and him, or maybe talk to the Akhani's or the Taliban about Mark Frerichs, but there might, there's usually a military line of effort in the backdrop that's still kind of, uh, I guess, a uh, uh, boil or brewing and to see if we can find enough information, specific locations to execute. There's usually a law enforcement angle. Uh, that, that involves uh, members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Justice, working with the law enforcement agencies in the area to see if they can uh, find out where the people are and, and either negotiate or receive a release. Uh, on my side, it's usually uh, kind of problematic in that if I were to go, for example, to talk with JNIM uh, in the Kadal region of Mali, there are some security considerations. Now, I might be flip enough to say, as a former Green Beret, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I think I can manage it, this, that, and the other. But you really can't look at it like that. You're putting the prestige of the United States on getting uh, to a place to talk to the uh, terrorist group. 
And you have to ask, is that better done in their base camp in Northern Mali? Or is that better done in a neutral place in Geneva? Or is it better done through a third party intermediary or a country that might have better relationships with the terrorist group? Um, then you get into the, the problem of what kind of concessions you can give. If it's Russia, we have a different pile of concessions that we possibly could throw into the mix if we're trying to make a, uh, or, or trying to bring someone home. If it's a terrorist, there are certain things that we're not allowed to throw onto the table. Uh, for instance, you would not want to put a bag of money on the table to a hostage group when that money could quickly be turned around to generate uh, a lot of death and destruction uh, at their behalf, on their behalf. So there are things that we have to worry about in terms of um, uh, what we can offer. Um, there are legal considerations too. I know Chris had to become an expert in all that up at the White House. There are policy perceptions, congressional um, uh, stakeholders that have to be engaged. So I would say in dealing with a, a hostage group, frankly, you, you think it would be simpler, but it might be a little more problematic than dealing with a nation state. And yet maybe what I'd like to convey to your listeners is we've done that stuff before. We've had some successes. We have a way of doing business and we're light years of, ahead of where we were in 2014, thanks to the efforts of guys like Chris. But we also have a ways to go. Uh, I'd like to think of SPIHA right now as uh, Evolution 2.0. I think we're quickly progressing to 3.0 uh, next year. I think we have a few things that will fall in place in the next probably five or six months. But eventually someone else is going to replace me and they'll take this to 4.0, 5.0 and our way of engaging with nation states and terrorist groups will become uh, more refined and become hopefully more productive. Well, I couldn't say it any better. I would just add also to foot stomp the idea of working with foreign partners and, and ramping up their experience, sharing our lessons learned, which is part of what we did this week. Uh, these kinds of engagements really build a capacity to do these kinds of things. And I think our partners are, are excited to hear our willingness to share these lessons learned because we want to bring human beings, we want to get them reunited with their family because they've lost their freedoms and in many cases are in horrible conditions. So well, well said, uh, Ambassador. I'm, I'm excited but a little frightened by the next question because these are so incisive, but go ahead, Amanda. Okay, I'm, I'm going to jump back to our friend Susan's question who wants to know, uh, what impact do you think um, Trevor King, uh, who was wrongfully detained in Russia, he was released, now he's been found to be wounded in Ukraine. Um, do you think that that will have any impact on negotiations for Gerskovich or Paul Whelan being released? Well, Susan, great, great question. Uh, we're not sure. Um, I think I think three and a half years ago, when I took this job, if I were if, if I was experienced uh, the Trevor Reed situation, uh, I might be more inclined to think that would have great impact. Uh, now, like I said, despite the fact that we've had a pretty tough relationship with the Russians, we're still finding ways to talk and sort things out. Um, and that might be the best way to, uh, rather than waxing philosophic for quite some time, I'd say number one remains to be seen. Number two, uh, I'm still optimistic that we're going to find a way to get to the table and regardless of things like that, to an extent, treat it like a distraction and get to the hard business of, of uh, coming up with an agreement that both sides can live with. So I, I hope that's a, I, I probably could go into more depth three or four months from now when I have a little more experience, I can reflect on something that's happened. But where we stand right now, uh, I think we're going to be able to push through and, and work on Evan's return and Paul Whelan's return. Well, we've got some very nuts and bolts, simple questions, but I, I like those, but they may also give methods that you don't want to share. So Fair enough. How, do you, how do you motivate hostage takers to comply with the U.S.? Well, you know, it's um, the complying is hard because uh, I think I'm going to say something that seems kind of strange, um, and yet it's worked for us, and that is... Uh, we try to sit down and have a real conversation. Um, you've got to think a lot of these people who have taken hostages, they've had the entire world shaming them for quite some time and for all the right reasons, for all the right reasons. And yet when I'm there, my job is to build a relationship 
with the person across the table and get to a point where even though we're both going to be trying to leverage each other, even though we're representing countries that may not necessarily uh, have the best relationships, I've got to build a relationship with that person because when I call him at two in the morning or his president's pressuring him to do something which is hard, I want to have something to where we can call and talk something out. Um, you don't always get that. I could give you an example or two. Actually, I won't give you an example or two, but there are examples where you're just not going to get that relationship. Um, it's to the, the negotiation, despite your uh, efforts to make them a little more informal, might be a little too structured and formal um, due to the country's culture, uh, or it could be due to the way that the negotiation was set up. However, there are examples that I could give you and won't of conversations in which I know, right? Um, conversations where you're actually able to build a personal relationship and it's it's paid off when yeah. you know my president's trying to get me to do something and I'm trying to work his his the, uh, our president's interests and his president's trying to work his and we start to clash I'm able to on a very personal level work with someone to try to uh, narrow the gap between our two sides to get someone back and we've had some good luck on that uh, and maybe I got that in part, uh, that, you know, I didn't go to Harvard to negotiation school. I didn't go to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, but I am a graduate of the Special Forces Qualification course. And um, as a part of what we do there, you end up going through exercises where you're going to have to talk to, negotiate, build relationships, build rapport mm -hmm. with people that uh, maybe come from different cultures, different economic backgrounds, uh, who maybe not, who might not even have the same uh morals or ethics that you do and yet you've got to build a relationship and promote u.s national interests on the ground and i think as a part of that it, it, it helps you see the world as a tough place but not necessarily black and white and that when you have to build that relationship and get it done you've got to bring every bit of yourself to that negotiation you can't just bring the shaming out you can't just bring a hard exterior Sometimes you really have to bring your personality to bear and your emotional side and give your entire self into that negotiation and then see where it takes you. Uh, again, probably not ever going to be taught at Harvard. Um, uh, I think overall, my office, uh, we bring people to this office that are compassionate, empathetic, uh, and I would say passionate. And to be frank, we hire people that seem to be workaholics. I'm not sure if that we're choosing them that way or it just happens to be that way. There are a lot of them around this city. <laughs> I know, D.C., yep. Yeah, a, a great uh, uh, recruiting pool. But we really tried to bring the people that can build relationships, not only within our government, not only with the families of those being held, but also with the bad guys. Yeah, again, well said, uh, Ambassador. I would just add that there was a reason why hostage issues were placed at the National Security Council in the office that works counterterrorism, because we have varied tools, which means when Coleman, Caitlin Coleman was held hostage by the Taliban, then turned over ultimately to loosely the Haqqani network, we didn't stop putting pressure on the Haqqani network. So those counterterrorism tools, direct action, candidly, were directed against Haqqani terrorists. These were individuals that were killing people, uh, innocent civilians on the ground in Kabul, to include Americans, but innocent Afghans and Pakistanis in Pakistan. All of that said, um, we use all of those tools and uh, you can talk while you're fighting too. And I think uh, Ambassador Carson's made that point very well. Oh my gosh, we have got really got an embarrassment of riches in the questions department. Um, but how do you prioritize resources? Which case is given priority? And of course, I don't know if you can comment either of you, but does the media exposure play any role? Oh my goodness, that's a lot to unpack. So when we when I uh, took this job, uh, I was the fourth person to join. Robert O'Brien had gone to the uh, National Security Council. He did what any good leader would do. He took his two or three best people with him. And so I walked into an office with three people. I was number four. And I sat down with my chief of staff, Kara Lee Walker, and we said, look, we've, we've got to institutionalize this office. So this is going towards a resources and prioritization question. So we just took that military uh, uh, way of doing business, .mlpf, 
Uh, and you, I don't know if anyone knows what that is. I'm sure Chris does. It's, it's doctrine, organization, training, material, leadership, education, personnel, facilities. And we tried to map out what we wanted the next two or three years to look out or look like. And that enabled us to uh, build a bigger office, to hire more people, to lock down job descriptions. Uh, there was a time when everyone in my office could have disappeared and no one would replace them. Well, now, if someone leaves my office, the State Department owes me another person because it's built in as a valid requirement to the State Department personnel process. We've worked on getting a budget and finalizing a budget and having a budget line. We've worked on uh, the relationships, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, if you will, to get this done. And why this pays off is there was a time when I, Roger Carstens, was the case officer for about 30 to 35 cases. And I was also the family engagement guy for 30 to 35 cases and the media guy and the congressional guy and the guy going to brief the secretary. And now we have it to where I have case officers. I have one person that manages my European uh, theater cases, another one who manages Asian cases, uh, another one that manages so on and so forth. And uh, if, if uh, someone's portfolio is becoming too big, we simply throw an extra person at it. So the day-to-day -day management of where we want to go in the strategy, trying to get the football to go down the field, is now covered by a case officer. The family engagement is covered by a case officer and my family engagement team, where I have full-time employees to include a psychologist who work with the families uh, to make sure that we're taking care of their needs, whether it's helping them with the IRS, who might still be trying to send a tax bill to someone who's been held a hostage for two or three years in, in Mali, or it could be trying to make sure that they get the mental support or psychological support that they need to undergo this experience. Um, I have a congressional engagement person who handles uh, our, our uh, engagements with Congress. We have a public affairs team that handles our engagements with the media. So the bottom line is I've yet to be in, in a position where I, I must prioritize in other words, we have about 30 to 45, uh, 40 cases right now, and we've brought back 30, roughly 30 people in the last uh, two or so years, and yet we've always found a way due to the structure and organization to where we were not overwhelmed, and I had to sit there and decide, you know, make a Sophie's choice whether we bring this person home or this person home. The structure is such that we can engage all cases at once, and as cases bubble up, suddenly you have a breakthrough. That's when we'll just surge resources and try to take that into completion. But what would happen if two things surge or three things surge at the same time? There's a reason why I have a deputy, uh, Steve Gillen, who is known by everyone at the Department of State. If, if I'm not there because I'm negotiating with another power and the, the secretary needs to talk to someone, he knows by name the top three or four people in my office, as does the White House. So we've tried to make it institutionalized and this, this might be a joking statement to say, but in the military, you want to get it to where the, the lieutenant gets wounded, the, the, the platoon still moves forward. And in my office, if I get fired, uh, get hit by a bus, quit one day, uh, decide I can't take it anymore, there's no problem. We've institutionalized what we do. We've managed troops to task, and the organization continues with, with or without me. And, and that's, that's, the strong, that's a strong point to be in. So do I really have to decide how I manage resources and throw it out? In a way, not, not right now, because we've, we've managed, I think, uh, by structure, how we address that. In terms of the media, it really is what it is. When I took this job and I talked to my predecessor, Robert O'Brien, who, whom Chris knows very well, I really thought this was all going to be done in smoke-filled back rooms, that I would be meeting with a terrorist group in Geneva or meeting with the Russians and, you know, uh, a caviar bar with, you know, a really smoke-filled backrooms. And yet, it's just the way it is. I mean, the media has taken a hold of this, and I can't sit there and say whether it makes it hard or not. It just, it just is. And we've just had to factor that in as a part of uh, how we see the, the battles uh, field before us. But I think what the, the question really wants to know is, how is it really affecting us? If I were to be very honest, I'm not sure all my team would agree with me. I actually think it's been a positive. Uh, I would actually, this will sound strange because I'm from the executive branch of the government, but when I talk about this network that we've tried to build, I include the media. Uh, so I expect CNN or the Wall Street Journal to ask me hard questions, to hold me accountable. I don't expect them to cut me any slack, but at the same time, 
they at times have sh uh, shown a spotlight on a family of a hostage who's in need, or they brought a case to uh, bear where now I have larger congressional in interest, which actually gives the president uh, more maneuvering space when it comes to making a decision. So uh, for better, for worse, it, the media is always going to be there from now on. In fact, there are some cases I wish they would actually take more of an interest in. There might be one or two cases I wish they'd take less of an interest in. But overall, I'd say the attention that we've received has been a surprising net positive, whereas three and a half years ago, I may not have given you that same answer. Chris, we what do you think? Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I just wanted to comment that we like to, when there's an opportunity, talk a little bit about leadership and what our audience just heard, particularly our youth youth audience that, believe it or not, signs in and asks extraordinary questions on spy chat. What you just heard implicit in everything Ambassador Carstens talked about was a self-actualized leader, a world-class team that he leads, mission type orders, and someone that's not scared to just offer the intent and let people execute. And we don't have to be there when you're that uh, the principal leader when you have a team that you know can step up. So that's the kind of team Ambassador Carstens has. That's the kind of team uh, Mr. Chris O'Leary has over at the Fusion Cell in FBI headquarters. And I think that's the kind of team that's at the White House as well. Go ahead, Amanda. That's, Give us another hard one. <laughs> I, well, you know, I like this one a lot. What other governments and or organizations do you think are particularly adept at negotiation, negotiating the return of detainees? I love, I love hearing who else are the key players in, you know, global perspective. Oh boy, you know, it's funny. You, you think this would be one I could talk about, but this is one where I probably have to keep some distance. So, but I will say just because Chris and I were just there. Um, I'll just throw one example out. Uh, there, there are actually, if I were to sit there and sketch it out, there are a lot of countries that we rely on uh, in this business. Um, I'll say Qatar has been a wonderful ally. The fact that they hosted us on this topic has been amazing. They've been a wonderful partner uh, and talking us through a lot of these uh, events around the world. Uh, so I definitely throw Qatar up there, um, but I'll throw Canada up there as well. Uh, about two plus years ago, Canada led the uh, Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention in state-to-state -state relations, an effort which garnered 70 different countries showing up and signing on to a document that is trying to establish a norm against wrongful detentions and hostage taking. So the Canadians have been great partners as well. But let me tell you where Secretary Blinken wants to take this. Uh, I'll back up a little bit. When we were doing, uh, when we were building the office out with that dot MLPF, the doctrine, organization, et cetera, we also said, what are our essential tasks? We had to really determine that so we didn't allow mission creep to maybe distract us or take our focus away. And we really came up with four tasks. Number one, bring people home. Number two, take care of the families, build a relationship with them and truly partner with them. Number three, expand the network. Number four, deterrence. Secretary Blinken, uh, after a very tough meeting on one country, came out and he said, you know, we've got to get to the point where we put uh, to hostage taking as a tool of state diplomacy, we take that and put it onto the dustbin of history. And he said, it's not going to happen in, in five years. It's more of like a 10 or a 15 year solution, but we have to start now. And he said, Roger, I'm not going to be the secretary of state and probably there'll probably be three or four or five by the time we get this done, but we need to build a multilateral coalition that's willing to stand up against the countries and organizations that would do this. And we also need to explore a toolkit so that we don't just always reach for the sanctions button. It's, just, it's, it's always an easy, you know, oh, let's, work, let's sanction this person. Some countries, there's har hardly any other sanctions you can add. They've already been sanctioned to high hell or heaven rather, and there's nothing more to add. And so what are the tools that can be used in diplomacy, intelligence, information, military, law enforcement, economic, financial, across all elements of national power what tools can we use? What do we need to ask Congress to help us create through different authorities? What tools are out there that have never been put to the service of deterrence? That's what we got to bring to bear in order to get this done. And in a perfect world, if someone from Kenya is taken hostage or taken wrongfully detained by another country, 
you want to see 10 or 20 countries going to that one to, to the uh, offending country and saying we're all coming at you we're all going to use these tools and at that point the country that's been taking hostages will say this is now too costly of an endeavor we're leaving this behind so we're already working on that i wouldn't want to give the countries names because literally they want to remain quiet until we built the architecture but behind the scenes we're already working with with allies to create that deterrence effect yeah, I would just uh, reiterate the point that there are ambassadors that have become lifelong friends of mine because of their willingness to use the good offices of of their state to support our hostage recovery efforts. And, and like the ambassador said, we're not going to call them out. They don't want to be called out. But I think our audience would be pleasantly surprised. It's a long list of nations that want to help us return an American to their families. All right, we have no time, but we can squeeze in this one because someone wants to know, are there any women involved in these negotiations? Oh my goodness. If, if uh, You know, it's funny, uh, at one point when I actually looked at the math, 50% of my office uh, was made up of women. Um, so uh, I would say the, the effort to be inclusive uh, across the entire spectrum of what this country is like in my office is definitely there. Um, so the answer is yes. You know, if we're gonna go to, to I could, I'm dying to give you an example where uh, in one negotiation, frankly, with the Taliban, uh, my, uh, my, my, my wingman, so to speak, was a wing woman. So the bottom line is if, if you have the, the energy, compassion and empathy, you can come to the office and we're taking you to negotiations. We really don't care as long as you get the job done. So that's a short, a long way of saying, yes, there are women on the team and uh, they're, they're doing great. Yeah, I would right. just, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Amanda, I know you're getting ready to wrap up. I would just tell you, I had a woman in my office that slept at her keyboard during the, um, the Coleman recovery. She would lose her mind if I called her out publicly, plus she's still serving in the U.S. government. So these are tireless public servants dedicated to the families. The families know who we're talking about, these these women that work the cases, but we're not going to call them out here. Now, thanks, Amanda. Back to you, although I want to offer a final thanks after Please you. Please say okay. some final words, because I, I know we have to get the ambassador off to the next thing. Ambassador, thank you so much for the past few days in Qatar. Thank you for joining us today. This has been educational. I knew it would exceed my expectations, but I think this reiterated all the things that I've tried to talk about, but not from an insider's point of view. Uh, so thank you very much for your friendship, your support to these efforts in helping us at the Spy Museum continue to educate the public. And of course, our world-class team uh, can't be matched. Uh, so over to you, Amanda. I just want to thank you both for this riveting conversation. This program will be on YouTube in a bit once the ambassador and Chris approve it. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone's questions. There were so many. Um, just so excellent. And what I want everyone to know is we're taking a break in August, but we are going to have a very cool live in-person spy chat in September. We will stream it out for those who are not local. We know there are lots of you and we love you all around the world. That's gonna be someone almost as cool as the ambassador. <laughs> maybe, maybe that cool, maybe even cooler. We can't tell you yet. Watch our calendar for that and other things. Ambassador, thank you so much. Amanda, Chris, thank you so much. Spy Museum, thank you. And to your awesome audience with those great questions, what an honor and pleasure to stay with you today. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys.